Hello friends, today we'll be looking at the movie The Tank from 2023. Solid movie, but it's filled with bad decisions the characters make. Just what we like to see. Hope you enjoy, let's go. We open in 1946 when a man at 3 a.m. in the morning and during a heavy rainstorm decides to leave the comfort of his bed to climb down the water tank in his backyard. Whatever convinced this guy to do this at this hour, I don't know. Maybe men in 46 were just built differently. Maybe he's just stupid. It's hard to imagine a valid reason to do this at that time. And sure enough, the moment he ventures down there, he is attacked by something bigger than him and dragged inside. He's screaming in pain, struggles against the beast that is pulling him backwards, but eventually loses the fight and dies a pretty unnecessary, pathetic death. We cut to 1978 now. The guy we have just seen perish, for better or worse, had successfully spread his offspring before he died. This is his son Ben. He runs a patch up with his wife Jules and they have a roughly 10 year old daughter. Today they are surprised by an attorney walking into their shop, bringing them good news. Apparently, Ben's late mother owned huge property around Hobbits Bay up in Oregon. She never said anything about it, but considering her psychiatric condition, Ben is not that surprised about it. The attorney also uncovers the fact that his father, the guy we had just seen, as well as his sister have not died in a car accident like his mother used to claim, but both drowned under mysterious circumstances around the mentioned bay. As the viewers, however, we know that his father's death was a bit more mysterious than just a simple drowning. We also know that his father died at a different timing than his sister who was sleeping when his father went down the tank. They both perished before Ben was born though, so he never got to meet them and only heard of them in his mother's stories. In case you wonder, yep, that means she was pregnant with him when the two died. The attorney also hands him over the key to the house and leaves him a bunch of old documents. Now inheriting anything of value without expecting it is great, right? It's like living life on easy mode. However, the property in this film, well, it comes with a pretty big liability. Let's have a look. Our family does what every other family with a 10 year old daughter would do. They get ready, pack their things and what feels like the next day drive all the way up to Oregon and find their inherited home completely overgrown. The interior is dusty, the windows badly insulated and the house generally in no condition to house anyone. Stepping into the backyard they are surprised by the most beautiful scenery with a stunning view of their bay. Apparently, their land goes all the way down to the beach and even includes small rock formations inside the ocean. It's pretty sick. Now Ben walks over to the infamous water tank, opens the hatch and explains to his wife that these things were used to carry rain and spring water to supply the house with constant water flow. Doesn't sound very sanitary to me, but I guess times were different pre-World War II. Now despite Benjamin here never having met his father, he too seems a little bit too excited about this water tank. He decides to hop in and check it out. He finds an old lantern and more importantly witnesses that the tank is more like a cave. A cave that goes deep into the space underneath their house. It's a bit concerning if you ask me. Now you already know where this is going I think. As he gets out again, the family starts cleaning out the house as best as they can. They remove the covers from the windows, try to fix the water supply and try to turn this house into something that can actually house people. They also bring in camping gear from their car, obviously implying that they have already planned to stay in this house for some time. That's more than strange. Let's rewind this for a second. Now, firstly, this house is so overgrown that it doesn't even look like a house. Considering that it had been abandoned for several decades at this point, this isn't that much of a surprise. The surprise here is the fact that this family has seemingly planned to stay in that house to begin with. A house they have never seen before but must have assumed that it was most likely in terrible shape. Knowing all of that, why then plan to stay there overnight? It's an obvious health risk and it's probably not gonna work. So. All of this doesn't make much sense. Now, As the first night creeps in, the couple looks through some old documents and photos they found while cleaning the house. It's mainly articles about suspected foul play when his father and sister drowned, as well as diary entries of Ben's mother. She wrote about how his father suddenly disappeared without a trace, and five days after his disappearance, his sister vanished as well. I don't know about y'all, but two mysterious disappearances are two red flags in my book. But it doesn't stop here, nope. 
That same night, their daughter hears strange sounds coming from the outside. Witnessing the floor beneath the room to move, she wakes up her mother and tells her that something is trying to get inside. Her mom checks out the window and hears the menacing sounds as well. She slowly walks through the whole house and keeps hearing those strange sounds. They come from the walls and from underneath the floor. She even meets her husband in the staircase who also hears the same noise. Now, If three people hear the same noise and it worries them all, that is one more red flag you better not miss, right? Now, they keep looking for the source but split up to do so, because remember, this is still a horror film. Jules even goes outside, seemingly having already forgotten about the mysterious disappearances she read about two hours ago. And don't get me started about their daughter who is now all by herself inside the house. Jules and Ben eventually meet up again somewhere in their backyard and decide that the noise was probably nothing and go back to sleep. Well, if it was enough for them to literally walk through the backyard and look for it for 10 minutes straight, it probably wasn't just nothing, right? Well, the next day, they continue with prepping the house and Ben once again ventures down into the tank. He checks out the cave and finds a suspicious creature lying on the ground. He picks it up, brings it inside the house and inspects it with his wife. But even she can't tell what it is, despite being a specialist for such things. She claims that it's some sort of amphibian larva and that they should take it back home when they go back. Now, I don't want to be a smartass here, but the larva that is as big as a decent sized fish kind of implies the creature that it becomes is massive too, no? Well, while they're looking at that thing, little sunshine is checking out the tank from above until she spots a massive thing moving inside of it. She screams, the parents run outside, comfort her, but ignore her claims of having seen a massive thing down there. You know, the same place Ben had just found a giant amphibian larva in two and a half minutes ago. Probably just the sound of the water pipes. Water pipes, of course, it's just water pipes. Why not, you know, open the hatch and have a look, it's right there. They are then distracted by a woman walking out of their house into the backyard, pretty bold considering this is America. This is Mariel, a local broker who was called by our family's attorney. She will help them sell the property if they want to. She already has a potential buyer claiming that they would move fast if the price is right. And according to our characters' faces, the price they bid seems to be way higher than they had anticipated. They are happy about the offer and decide to at least meet the prospects during the following days. They also use a chance to ask Mariel about the house and its legacy, like who owned the house before Ben's father acquired it back in the 30s. There is not much background story to be honest, but apparently the land is cursed. Surprise, surprise. Local natives claim that after a devastating tsunami ravaged up here a few hundred years ago and opened up the earth, it left nothing but death and destruction. Thus, cursing it. Now, as the meeting concludes, Mariel walks back up to her car, of course it's dark already, enters her car and attempts to drive off, but she is stuck in the mud. She leaves the car again to check if there is anything that can be done, but... I guess not today. Meanwhile, our family is again tormented by odd sounds hauling through the whole house, oblivious to the fact that Mariel has just died a painful death just a few hundred meters away. Looking for the sounds, again, Jules comes across a shadowy figure luring just outside the kitchen window. She screams and has her husband magically appear. He rationalizes that it's probably just a raccoon and calms his wife down by adding that they will contact Mariel the next day and move forward with the sale in the next two or three days. Now, after all the red flags of the past 24 hours, I think he actually makes a pretty sensible decision here. Yes, it's creepy, yes, weird stuff keeps happening, but packing up their stuff right now and leave in the middle of the night with their child would be unreasonable as well. However, dismissing your wife's sight of before is also probably not the best thing to do, considering that they're in the middle of nowhere, probably don't even have a phone in their house that works, being more precautious than not would make more sense. I guess it's time to barricade yourself into your rooms, wait for the next day and zip away as quickly as possible. Now, the following day, when the water comes out completely black, Ben goes to check out the water tank to see if he finds anything wrong with it. 
He finds a tank filled with water so deep, it would be difficult for anyone smaller to be able to stand in there. And he indeed finds a cloth clogging one of the pipes, as well as a dead raccoon floating inside the water. With this finding, he can eventually convince his wife that whatever she had seen last night outside the kitchen window was indeed just a raccoon. He also tells her that he will be driving over to the gas station shortly to refill their gas tanks. However, that would have been the right time to take your whole family with yourself instead of leaving them back inside the house that's literally one giant red flag. Now, the moment he drives up the path, it gets even worse. He naturally comes across the abandoned car of Mariel from yesterday. He tries to search the place for any clues, ventures into the forest nearby and very soon comes across the mutilated body of the broker. He rushes back to his car and attempts to contact emergency services with the walkie-talkie inside his car. Meanwhile, we cut to Jules, who sees the hatch of the tank being opened once again, despite having closed it herself a while back. As she goes downstairs, she witnesses multiple traces of water on the floor. She closes the entrance door, retrieves a bunch of keys and enters an adjacent room in which she finds another diary of Ben's mother that she hasn't apparently read before. It describes the horror his mother had experienced and is also the reason why she tried to keep him away from this place by not telling him about it. Now, While reading the text, she hears heavy footsteps outside the door and starts to fear for her daughter's safety. She breaks out of the window and storms upstairs hoping to find her safe. We then once again cut to Ben who is also storming back to the house hoping to find his family still alive. They meet up upstairs and share what they have found out. While Jules tells him about the new diary entries she found, he tells her about the dead body he found up the hill. He also claims that he contacted the sheriff and that they're on their way. The new plan is obviously to survive this night, but the way they go about this, I don't know, makes you scratch your head. Check this out. Ben literally hikes up the same way he just drove down from, attempting to go back to Mariel's car by foot for no reason whatsoever. It's not like he just found a dead body up there, right? And it's not like he was just told by his wife about, you know, creatures killing people around here. Why he would go back is not even explained. He does it literally for no apparent reason. He also took literal minutes to drive up and down before, but now arrives by foot in mere seconds. The sheriff too conveniently arrives just at that moment, but he comes all alone. That's a bit strange. Remember, he was called because a dead body was found. There is no way a single cop would arrive after such a call. Cops usually travel in teams for, well, safety reasons, at least where I'm from. But even if that's not the case in the States, if there is a casualty involved, there is always an ambulance or an EMT joining. This right here is probably not how things would go in real life. The cop is attacked by the monster immediately that we finally get to see as well. It's a nasty, slimy thing that sounds like a dinosaur straight out of Jurassic Park. The cop can't use his gun properly and is soon dragged into the forest while Ben witnesses everything from a safe distance. His first reaction? Running back to his family. Yeah, no joke, why did you come up here in the first place, right? Before he gets back to his family, let's rewind for a second and check if there were any alternatives he could have pulled. When Ben found the abandoned car of Mariel, he could have realized that something bad must have happened without leaving his car, right? However, he decided to check out the area and found a dead body. That was reckless, but gained him some clarity about the severity of the situation. He also contacted the police immediately, which was rather good. However, he would have done well to at least roll away Mariel's car from obstructing the path. This car not only prevents any external help from coming through, but it also makes it difficult for anyone wanting to escape. And considering the looks of the car, Mariel likely abandoned the car in a rush, meaning the keys were still inside. A little bit of preparation goes a long way, my friends, especially when you got a family to protect. The fact that he sped back to the house though to take care of his family was a good idea on the other hand. So let us have a look how our family proceeds. With the police render pointless, the family is all by itself. They tried to scheme a plan to survive the night. So far the creatures could have only been heard at night. Ben also has never seen any of them when he ventured down the tank, apart from the larva of course. This means that as long as we can survive this night, we should be good. Right? Well, 
Jules thinks it would be best to get to the car and escape, but Ben says that with their daughter it would be impossible to get to the car in time. Both valid points. What would you do in this situation? Try to get to the car or stick it out inside this house? Well, Ben decides to build a bomb with the gas leftovers inside the shack nearby and bomb the creature's nest. Sounds like a good idea, but we don't even know how many of those monsters are around, right? By going solo, he will inevitably leave his family back alone as well. That's an error because even if he successfully destroyed the nest, as well as a bunch of those things, we know for a fact that there is at least one more up the hill feasting on the cop. Meaning a showdown is probably gonna happen anyway. So instead of wasting the bomb inside the tank, that could by the way also lead to the cave literally caving in and burying the house with his family inside, it may make more sense to simply obstruct the hatch of the tank with a heavy object so that the creatures couldn't escape. In a scene before, we have seen a working fireplace inside the house. This means they must have access to an ex, and an ex is a friend, and the friend is what our family needs right now. Once the bomb is ready and the family armed, it's time to barricade ourselves in a room with just one entry door as always and wait for the mobs to come. The 500 hours we have spent beating zombie mode in our teen years will safely guide us through the night. But that is not what happens of course, no. Ben leaves his family back, collects the items he needs to build the bomb, builds it and enters the tank. Not sure how that makes sense since you now will fight them in their natural habitat, plus you literally can't see them, but okay. Only moments pass and he indeed faces off one of the monsters directly. He somehow passes it off camera, gets to a dry spot inside the cave and lights his makeshift bomb on fire. He jumps back into the water as the bomb explodes in the background. But apart from a loud bang, literally nothing else happens. In fact, the next thing that happens is him being attacked inside the water. Looks like the bomb didn't do much. Meanwhile, Jules and her daughter are waiting for any signs of Ben when suddenly a loud bang is heard just outside their door. With potentially a dozen monsters lurking around, what is the best course of action here? That's right, you open the door and have a look. No, you don't do that. I don't know why these characters keep doing these things. A few moments pass and while Ben is tormented with vicious attacks inside the tank, Jules is once again surprised by pounding from outside. But with the family dog inside her room now, this can only mean one thing, right? Her barricade is broken through swiftly and her daughter pulled outside the window into the nest of the creatures. She rushes down and comes across Ben who is severely injured just on top of the tank. He clearly is in no condition to fight anymore, so Jules takes the initiative and plans to save their daughter. Just before though, when she was fighting off one of the monsters, she could successfully ward it off by using a can of chemicals. And being a specialist for amphibians, she realizes that any toxins will likely keep them at bay. So she arms herself with chemicals, soaks her makeshift torch in gas and ventures down into the tank. As many chemicals are filled with heavy metals, she pours the liquids all around her in an attempt to build a barrier between her and the monsters. It's a pretty smart idea. She uses a time window to climb into the cave and finds her daughter safe and sound. Now, For some reason, the kit has not yet been torn into pieces, like every other victim so far, but I guess, you know, luck is still a thing here. As she helps her daughter to climb out of the tank, she uses the chemical spray to shield off the incoming monsters and then too escapes through the hatch above. They both make it safely to the police car where she retrieves a gun. Venturing back to the house, she successfully saves her husband who is badly injured but apparently still alive. They make it up to the car and the family happily escapes thereafter with the sun finally rising just in time as well. That's right, my friends. A bunch of bad decisions coupled with a bunch of plot holes always ends up in a happy ending. However, the film wasn't half bad. The cinematography was pretty good, the acting okay, and the edit pretty on point as well. The only thing that was lacking was the story. Now, I hope you've enjoyed this video, my friends, our take on it. And with that said, we'll catch you again next week. You take care and you know the drill. Binge another one.